Good morning. Hello. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jesse, and I am the volunteer coordinator for Coast Watch. During the month of June, we focused on rocky habitats on the Oregon coast. And on June 1st, Fawn Custer, Coast Watch's citizen science trainer, came to join us uh, to talk about tide pool ecology. Coast Watch is a mile by mile adoption program on the Oregon coast. Volunteers adopt a mile. We ask them to walk it at least four times a year. We provide them with a data sheet to uh, record some significant notables on their mile, and then they upload that to our website. We also connect our volunteers with scientists from Washington, Oregon, and California to do a lot more uh, surveys, including dead beach birds, marine debris, sea stars, hybrid beach grasses, a lot more. So um, please visit our website, oregonshores.org forward slash coastwatch for more information or if you would like to become a volunteer. And then my information, my contact information will be available at the end of Fawn's presentation. I mentioned a little bit about focusing on our rocky habitats this June. Um, we are assisting the public in learning about the rocky habitat management strategy. This is an update that is happening to our territorial sea plan um, created, that was created in 1994. And the public is asking, is being asked to propose changes um, to propose new designations for a number of our rocky habitats and places on the Oregon coast. So that pilot project started June 1st and will take it all the way to the end of December. Um, if you would like to be involved in that, you can contact me and also here's the website for more information, oregonocean.info. Coast Watch is a program of Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition. Oregon Shores has been around for a number of decades, helping to protect our coast, while Coast Watch deals with our volunteers um, and focusing on outreach and education. Oregon Shores is really focused on protections. So please check out Oregon Shores Conservation Coalition. You can become a member. You can learn all about the great work they do. Um, and you can learn how to support uh, Coast Watch programs as well. So with that, uh, I'll say goodbye to you for the moment. And then um, please stick around. There will be questions at the end of Fawn's webinar. And again, the webinar was recorded live. Um, and just thank you very much for being here. We'll see you at the end. Uh, Fawn Custer, I've been a marine educator for um, over 35 years now, oh my gosh, and so of course the best part of all this is being able to get into the tide pools and explore, as you can see here in um, the first slide that I have, um, in order to explore, you have to get right down there to see what's going on. So it's really good to have a good understanding of what's happening on the coastline. And so one of the things, of course, that I'd like everybody to be aware of is that we have an intertidal zone. And this is where most people are going to spend their time, especially right now when we're seeing some really great low tides. Um, through the first week of June here, we're going to see some minus tides again. And this is when you're going to be able to get down there and see some of these organisms that you wouldn't normally see because they would be underwater. Um, so the intertidal zone is that zone in between the high tide and the low tide. 
So um, what we have are actually a few different zones that we can look at. Um, the spray zone is the uppermost zone out there and it, it's normally so high that it only gets to see spray um, most of this time. What you will see is I'll show you a slide where sometimes that does get actually covered with water. We also have the high tide zone. In that area, you have to think about the animals that are being impacted by not only the um, the, uh, the lack of uh, salt water coming in when it's only high tide, but also drying out during the summer and of course the rain. And then you've got your mid tide zone. And this of course is the sweet spot. You know, this is where you get all the salt water or, um, you know, you get just enough to where it's not as much of a problem with drying out or not being covered by water or getting too hot. And then of course the low tide zone, which uh, again gets plenty of uh, water, but then you have to worry about all the other critters out there that might be wanting to eat you. And then of course the sub tide zone. We don't get to really see too much of that unless we're exploring into the tide pools themselves. So that spray zone I was talking about, that's that uppermost part of the rock here. This is a rock um, down here in Steel Rock. It's a little mountain. Actually, it's about 30 feet tall. Um, and so up in the top of that, in that area is where uh, we consider the spray zone. And then, of course, we have our high tide zone. This is where uh, the, again, most of the organisms are covered with water you know, a little less of the time, but they can be out of water most of the time. A lot of these slides you're going to see are, of course, of seal rock. In the back there, you see of this uh, background, you see elephant rock, which of course is, gets above that spray zone. Um, it may get the mist, and of course, that's where seabirds um, will nest up there. Okay. And then we have our mid-tide zone, that area that's covered half the time uh, with water. Um, and this is when you'll start to see some of the other rocks that are protruding um, up, you know, from the water when it's mid-tide. And then low tide, you know, everything is wide open out there then. Okay. And then, of course, your subtide, minus tides. When it's minus tides, you get to get a little bit further out, and that's when you actually get to um, look in those tide pools um, and explore those that you don't normally get to see, you know, as far as organisms go. Okay, so there are tide zones for algae and kelp as well. So in those uh, minus tide areas and very low tide areas, that's where you're normally going to find the red algae. So as you can see closest to the water there, that's where you're going to see more of your red algae down there because they can uh, photosynthesize with a lot less light. And then as you come towards the shore, toward the bottom of the screen, you see that you're coming to the mid-tide zone. So this is where you're gonna see the brown algae in there. Um, now red algae, I want everybody to be aware, everything from like a reddish brown, they can be a black color, um, or they can be a very red, like the red coral and algae that we'll see. Um, the brown algae can everything be everything from a real brown to kind of an olive green looking. And then when you get to the um, shoreline here, you start to see the actual green algae. And those are actually true green, so very bright with a, a lot more chlorophyll. Uh, so in the upper littoral algae, those are the you know spray zone and the high tide zone. You're going to see some of those that can be up out of the water a little bit, and um, normally you'll see a kind of a mixture between some of the reds and some of the browns and some of the greens. Though, in the upper left-hand corner, you see a combination of an ova. Um, which is um, intermorph, it looks like little intestines, and also the brownish 
stuff there is actually a red algae that's kind of drying out. That's porphyra. It's the nori that you guys would eat. Up in the ro upper right-hand corner, this up on top of the rocks is a type of a rock weed, but this is called pelvisiopsis. And it's a little skinnier than the rockweed fucus that you'll see a little bit lower. And we, we'll, we'll take a look at those. But this is up a little bit higher on the rocks. And then, of course, down the bottom, what you see, um, again, is a lot of that ulva. And it will normally grow in a lot of mats. But it'll grow either in the... Um, real long strands, enteromorpha, like you know, I always remember that with intestines, enteromorpha, or the ulva sheets, um, which are more flat single cell, but it's the same species, just a different form of that algae. Things we've learned through genetics. <laughs> Okay, then the other thing we have are the low tide algae and grasses here. Um, and again, those are uh, the grasses that you'll see out in the tide pools. Now, these are a little bit different than the algae as far as grasses go. What you'll see is in the upper right hand corner, you see the little seed pod because the grasses are actually a true angiosperm or true grass in the fact that they actually have to have roots in order to grow and to absorb liquid as well as throughout part of it. Uh, but they do put off flowers and seeds and this is what it looks like in the spring. Unlike algaes that don't have a root system, what they actually have is just a hold fast, it's kind of glued on, and then they take in water and photosynthesize and take in nutrients throughout the whole structure. So grasses, just like grasses on land, take up their nutrients through their roots and photosynthesize, you know, with the, the color. Now what you'll see here in the bottom right hand corner is the um, surf grass. Notice that it's got really thin blades. Um, on the left, it's kind of hard to tell, but that's more of an eelgrass. It's a little bit wider blade. Um, when you see the wide blade area uh, grasses, um, that's shallow. This pelvisiopsis over on the right hand side though, or, I'm sorry, not pelvisiopsis, but uh, philospadix. On the right side, it's a uh, surf grass. It's got thin blades and that actually uh, covers a lot of times deep tide pools. So don't be tricked into thinking that you can walk on that because it could be a six foot deep tide pool underneath. Learn that when I moved to Oregon. <laughs> All right, brown algaes and kelps. Remember we told you that's more of the mid-tide area there. Um, these are uh, heavier kelps. And again, um, just for your information, most of our kelps are edible, okay? There's only a couple that are a little bit more challenging, but people will um, be able to, they take them and dry them out and, uh, you know, grind them up and turn them into, um, like a seasoning, you know, something like that to put on their food, uh, wrap food in it. Nori obviously is used for wrapping your food in or just eating. So these are uh, the, the brown algae that you'll find out there. And a lot of organisms feed on these as well. Uh, the red ones, again, as I said, um, could be everything from little black looking up in the upper right hand corner to kind of reddish. I've got a, a real thin uh, red algae just kind of, I tried to take a picture of it floating in the water so you could see how thin the layer of that is. And then of course on the left side, I've also got a red algae there um, with um, some brown algae. But So it just shows you the difference in those different colors. Okay, so here are the challenges in the tide pool, obviously. Um, desiccation, drying out, because when the tide goes out, uh, especially during the summer, it gets very dry. And so these animals have to deal with the fact that they are gonna be um, with, you know, during times without any water around them. And so they've had to adapt to the fact that they, be, they have to be able to keep moisture in them some way, one sh way, shape, or form. Again, normally we get a lot of rain here in Oregon. So these animals who have been adapted to living in salt water now have to also adapt to the fact that um, periodically they're going to be inundated with fresh water. Um, space. 
um, it, it's all about location, location, location in the tide pools. And so with that, space is definitely a challenge for many of these organisms. And then of course, predators. There's always a predator prey competition going on there. And so for, um, you know, all these organisms that are living in these tide pools or in those sweet spots I was talking about, there's that competition for, um, you know, predation and to avoid being eaten. And then of course, the changing substrate. Most of you have recognized that when we've been to the beach throughout the year, we see that during the winter, those strong waves come in and they scour out the beach and pull all that sand offshore, um, just below the wave action. And then during the um, spring and summer, as we start getting those nice winds and those baby waves, it and then puts that sand back up on the beach. So these animals also have to adapt to the fact that there'll be times when they'll be um, inundated with sand. And so they can either move or not survive. And so these are a lot of the different challenges for these organisms in the tide pools. So the desiccation and the dry, um, dry area. Um, when you've been to the Devil's Punch Bowl or um, down to the tackles and you see those upper level rocks. Uh, what you'll notice is, of course, up there, that's primarily freshwater with some splash zone um, of salt water. And so these algaes and lichens that you see on the upper rocks um, are able to survive up there. Well, we also have some little tiny organisms that can live in that area that are able to survive uh, when um, it's a little bit drier. And those are those little tiny barnacles you see there and those little tiny snails called Litorina litorina. And they're actually not much bigger than, you know, your pinky fingernail. So they're real tiny little barnacles and um, snails. And the barnacles are filter feeders, so they wait for that splash to come in. But since they're so tiny, they only need the little bit of plankton that comes in with them. And then, of course, the snails are grazers, so they're feeding on any of that algae around them. As I mentioned, space. There's definitely competition for space. As you can see when you go down the tide pools, these organisms are very tightly packed. Um, and so it's a, sometimes you'll see them growing on top of each other as well. Um, and then of course, so here's what you see down the bottom, competition for that food and space. So what will happen with the barnacles is if the rock gets cleared off, the, bar, the algae kind of settles in, barnacle, barnacles settle in between the algae, and then the mussels come in and they settle in between them, bump off the barnacles, and then the barnacles start to grow on top of the mussels. And, um, and then underneath all of that, you actually have a lot of organisms that are living underneath those massive mussel beds um, because this provides home for them. So underneath there, you see, for example, these little baby sea stars that I have up there, which are actually also not more than maybe uh, two or uh, maybe three millimeters across. Um, you're seeing little tiny barnacles, so little tiny things that are living up underneath there so they can avoid being eaten. Um, crabs, worms, snails, uh, a variety of organisms are all underneath that mussel bed for protection, for predation. Okay, so as I mentioned about the changing substrate, here inside the Devil's Punch Bowl, this is in the summer. Um, when you can see that's covered with sand. And I forgot to put a picture in here though, but if you go there in the winter, you're climbing around boulders. So this is really interesting to show you that change in the substrate there. But it allows you then to also get down underneath when we have those minus tides and see all the organisms that normally live inside of the, um, and under the water. This would normally be totally underwater most of time. So barnacles. Barnacles are in the group of animals, crabs, um, arthropods, meaning jointed appendages. Um, they start out as free swimming little um, organisms and then they smell the water, they settle down, uh, glue their head 
onto the rock or whale or whatever substrate they're going to live on, go through metamorphosis to look like the barnacles you see here, and then for the next 50 to 100 years or whenever something knocks them off the rock um, or eats them, they're standing on their head eating with their feet. So during the, uh, when, when you're looking in the tide pools, if they're still in the water, you'll see these little feathery, um, uh, appendages coming out and that's their feet and they feed on plankton so the thing is with these animals as you can see once they're glued down um, they actually are hermaphroditic and have have to fertilize from where they're at so the males actually have very long penises in order to fertilize barnacles so if we were looking at this group of barnacles up on the right hand corner up here and you can see the barnacle on the lower end would actually fertilize the barnacle up on the um, upper right hand corner and vice versa and all of those also then produce eggs and all of these eggs are released at the same time in the spring all these little larvae and they go swimming off and of course the uh, parents being uh, plankton feeders are also feeding like crazy at that point. So all these little organisms have to swim away as quickly as possible so their parents don't eat them. Um, I always think about that as teenagers, you know, it was like, oh my goodness gracious, you know. Anyway, on the bottom we have polycipes. Those are the gooseneck barnacles. Those are the ones that you see with the long stalk that are stretching out in the muscle beds. Normally you'll find those, again, uh, in the upper mid-tide zone, uh, along with all the muscles as well. And they are also a flank, uh, plankton, plankton feeding barnacle. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, so with this, what you're also seeing then is um, these organisms that are, again, tightly packed in there in order to provide protection for themselves from being preyed on by other things um, and also being able to reproduce in a small space. Um, isopods and amphipods, also arthropods. These, again, um, are the types of insects that you would see up in a, a uh, up and around all the rocks and under the sand and in the water. Um, the flattened ones that you see are the isopods. They're kind of flattened like cockroaches. The one that you see up in the upper left-hand corner is a rock louse. They normally like to be in the cave areas up a little bit higher on the rocks. Uh, the one that's on the bottom left, the bottom uh, left and uh, bottom two left and right, pictures there are the isopods that you'll normally find in the tide pools. Um, the one on the left on the bracelet, the one in the hands there, those are the two that you'd normally find down in the sand. And these, the two, those are actually, um, they'll feed on little uh, other little insects or you know other little uh, plankton in the sand and in the water. Um, the, Amphipod is like the beach hopper. You will find those in all aspects of the water and in the sand. And they're the ones, they're squished more like a flea, whereas the isopods are flattened, as you can see, like the um, cockroaches, okay? Snails. Uh, these are now moving into the mollusk family, and I'll get back to the arthropods here shortly as well. But snails are, uh, we have a variety of them. We have the, uh, you know, the little one that you see actually up in the upper left-hand corner is actually one of those little, little rind and blown up so that you can see it really well. But then in the center, that's a turban snail. You know, these are all grazing, you know, uh, types of, uh, snails that are either grazing or feeding on other animals. Um, the litterina and the turban snails are grazing snails, which means that they have a round opening in order, um, and they feed on the algae. But if you see the little yellow snail and the Oregon hairy triton down there, um, notice how their shell not only comes to a point at the back, but kind of comes to a little nodule point in the front. That's because those are predatory snails, and they actually will drill holes into clams or um, something smaller, uh, 
you know, barnacles, if you see little tiny holes, drill the hole into that with their proboscis, you know, grinding away. They have that really rough little tongue. And then what they'll do is put in digestive fluid, turn it into a liquid and slurp it out like a milkshake. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Lipids. Uh, these are also mollusks, um, but these animals, um, instead of having the, uh, their foot being able to stick out quite away, they only, they have the, uh, the solid shell on the top here. Uh, what I've done on the bottom is showing you a picture of what the, what that strong muscular foot of these snails looks like. So snails are in the moss family. They have a foot. Gastropods are these organisms and they have a, um, their mouth part is up at the end and then they have a little rhinophore. So they're smelling the water rather than, um, you know, seeing what's going on. Um, and this strong muscular foot helps them to hold on to their prey and on to the rocks. And these are um, grazing animals as well. So they're moving around, scraping the algae off the rocks. Uh, there are the two species of limbits. There is the, um, the limpet I showed you. And then there, here's the keyhole limpet. Now the advantage to being a keyhole limpet, by the way, is the fact that um, with the other limpets, their anus actually sticks out next to their head. And in this one, they actually excrete through the hole. I think if I was going to come back as a limpet, I would want to come back as a keyhole limpet. Just my thought. Um, in here again, you'll see the limpet is out feeding on algae, but notice again, how organisms are growing on top of its shell. So this is a nice old limpet because it's got a pretty good sized barnacles that are growing on it as well. And again, there's competition for space. This is uh, down here, uh, the, the shiny stuff that you see off to the right is like a tunicate. Uh, we have little babies, um, ochre sea stars in there. The, the gray one is an ochre sea star. The little pink one is a leptosterius or six rays star. We have some uh, gooseneck barnacles up in the upper left-hand corner. I see another little sea star. There, um, the red coral and algae that's growing here. So you have a whole bunch of organisms, again, taking hey, up a Vaughn. lot of space. We only see a little bit of bare rock just to the left. Hey, yes? Vaughn, this is Jesse. Um, yes. Uh, I'm wondering if you can use your uh, mouse and arrow um, to point out the sea stars that you pointed out. I don't know if everybody can see them without, yeah, exactly. Oh. There, there you go. If now folks can go. see um, uh, the, yeah, exactly. That, okay, star. Yeah. There you go. And which okay. one? Is that again? Oh. Yeah, so this is, okay, so this is the ochre star, the baby ochre star. No, actually, that's a leptosterius. I see it's got six rays now. <laughs> ah, so we have all leptosterius in here. Um, six ray stars. So most sea stars have five arms, um, but the leptosterius have six, six arms. And so here's another one here. I was counting its little six arms here. Here's another little sea star over here. Um, and then, of course, this is the red coralline algae. The only difference between this algae and this red algae is that this one has cellulose in the cells, and this one has calcium in the cells, but there are still organisms that feed on that. And then over here, this is what I'm saying. Here's a tunicate that's growing in here, kind of slimy looking. There's some gooseneck barnacles. And then, of course, the keyhole limpet here with the barnacles on it. Thank you so much. Thank you for reminding me to do that. Now. Sure, thank, thank you. you. Okay, other mollusks that you'll see in the tide pools. Uh, we have the different kinds of chitons. Now, chitons also have that strong muscular foot. They also have a rasping mouth, but instead of having a solid shell or no shell, they have these eight bony plates. And these little plates actually look like uh, butterflies. Um, and there, I've also learned that they're also the shape of your thyroid. A friend of mine was telling me that 
they had gone to the doctor and had a necklace made out of a chitin plate. And the doctor asked him if it was a way to protect them, protect their thyroid. So Mother Nature loves to um, duplicate, you know, all along. Um, so this is the woody chitin that you'll see up there. Again, these are feeding on the brown algaes. Um, this is the black chitin. You'll see these a little bit further out normally on the backside of rocks. They feed on the codium, which is a, a brown algae that actually grows encrusting on the rocks before it grows out. Um, and so that's, it feeds on that and they get to be pretty good size. This tonicella here, this is the one that actually feeds on that red coral and algae. Um, it's the lined chitin, and so you'll see it a lot of times in amongst that red algae. The largest chitin is going to be the gumboot chitin, and these can get to be oh, the size of a good meatloaf. As a matter of fact, they were considered the meatloafs of the sea by the natives. Um, and a lot of times if you find those big plates that look like uh, butterflies, uh, pieces of bone that look like butterflies, it's the plate from this particular organism. And you'll see these, um, if you're at Otter Rock, I've seen them there in the crevices in the tide pools there. Um, Yaquina Head has quite a few of them at, in their tide pool. They like the channels more than they like the other kind of rock structures. Okay. And then they come in a variety of different colors. So here's one that's a very reddish color, mostly they're orange. Here's one that's more of a green with some red on it. These are the, um, these are uh, photos of them that we've seen at uh, the Yaquina head um, in the channels there. Now we have seen a couple times when we have a die off of these all along the beach up here in the upper right hand corner. At first we, um, it, it was the first time it was noticed uh, and documented it was, I can't remember what was going on at the time, but then we had a coast watcher uh, from down south who said, oh, well, this happened about five years previous to that. Here, I've got a picture of the same thing happening. So we know that periodically there are a die off of those, but we're not really sure as to what that is at this time. But just so that you're aware of that. Um, another type of mollusk is a, another slug, and these are the um, sea slugs, and the nice thing about sea slugs is that they're absolutely gorgeous. This particular species of sea slugs, or these types, are the aeolids, and they are predatory sea slugs, um, so they feed on other organisms, um, primarily because you see the little serrata here at the back, what they'll do is they'll feed on hydroids, uh, which are animals that are in the coral family, so they have stinging cells. So when these animals feed on those, they've been able to incorporate those stinging cells into these serrata on their back, and that, that protects them from being eaten by other organisms. Now, the way that this, the nematocysts or these stinging cells work is that um, normally when you touch uh, jelly and you get stung, what's happened is it shot a little harpoon off into your skin and injected um, that toxin in there that then burns. Um, so these animals have figured out how to eat, you know, that, um, that nematocyst, that little spring-loaded stinging cell, and incorporate it in their uh, serrata without triggering it to go off until something tries to eat them, okay? Uh, so, you know, these animals are just pretty amazing with what they've come up with. So these are their rhinophores. They actually have a, a four sets of rhinophores in order to smell and taste the water that's around them. Okay, now these are the Dorid nudibranchs, and nudibranch means naked gills. So especially on these, you'll see them more easily. At the back of their body, you'll see their gill um, covering right at the back of their body, okay? Um, these animals, this is the uh, little leopard one. Here's its little um, gill plume back here at the back of its body. These animals are, um, they feed on sponges. And they're, they're pretty specific to the sponges that they'll feed on. Um, 
so for example the little red one here if you see the bright red sponge when you're underneath the rocks looking you'll probably find these little tiny red nudibranchs under there as well because they'll feed on it and then their egg cases are actually these ribbons they'll you'll if you see like this a real wide ribbon around it that's all coiled that's their egg cases that are coiled in um in amongst those as well so for example this one is actually also going to have a bright red egg case that's coiled in there with it okay um other arthropods that you'll see under the mussels um are these uh crabs these hermit crabs and porcelain crabs now in the, um, these animals are not true crabs, as you can see in my notes there, they only have the eight visible appendages instead of 10. Um, their fifth legs are vestigial, which means that they're um, not used for walking, um, but they're used for other purposes. In the hermit crab, their vestigial legs are used for holding on to the shell. Now these, our hermit crabs aren't like the ones that you'll get at the pet store. Ours are actually aquatic. The ones that you get at the pet, pet store are terrestrial. They'll, they can be out of water. All these crabs can be out of water um, for a short amount of time, but the terrestrial crabs actually go up on land um, and they live on land and they only go back down to the water just to breed and to release their eggs. Um, and all of the eggs will be released at once. All the babies go swimming off at once. The um, female will hold her egg case underneath the, um, her abdomen. So on this, for the porcelain crab, for example, under the abdomen here, um, if it was a female, you'd see a mass of brown eggs uh, just underneath there. They'll produce anywhere from 300 to 500 eggs at a time. It's pretty amazing. Uh, and then the other thing to note is that unlike true crab that you, you know, you're familiar with, Dungeness, and I'll show you that in a minute, uh, you can't tell the difference between the males and females in this case. Uh, they all look the same unless the female has her eggs underneath her abdomen. Okay, and these are the porcelain crabs. These are the ones that are, you'll find underneath the mussel beds. Whenever you pull them out, there are just tons of them. They're scavengers. They're feeding on everything dead and decaying that's underneath there. Okay, your true crabs, again, uh, you can tell the difference. This is a male. It has a long abdominal plate here. Uh, the female would have a more rounded plate. On the bottom, I'm pointing to the, the red crab on the bottom. It'll have a more of a round plate and, and she'll hold her mass of eggs in there. Uh, normally what happens with arthropods is that in order to grow, because they have that external shell, they have to molt. So what you'll find is that right after the female is molted, she's very soft. You've heard of soft shell crab, so she's very soft. And that's the time when the male will breed with her. Um, and then it takes about three days for her shell to get hard. And then once her shell, new shell is hard, then he cry, crawls off and uh, molts. Um, and so you'll see them wedged underneath the rocks and, and in the sand to protect themselves. Up on the right hand side here, this is a red rock crab. Rock crabs have the black pinchers. Um, they're quite aggressive. And yes, once they get hold of you, put your hand in the water. Um, do not shake it because the more you shake, the more they want to hold on. Um, so be aware of that for those of you who are new to this area. <laughs> the smaller crabs that we'll see here in the kelp um, are the different types of kelp and spider crabs. Uh, they primarily also feed on detritus, dead decaying stuff that's in amongst the, mm -hmm. um, the uh, kelp beds or in the algae. Uh, the uh, kelp crabs here can actually get quite large as compared to the decorator crabs. They'll stay pretty small, but the kelp crabs can get very large um, and they live in amongst the kelp beds again. Um, down here on the bottom is a decorator crab. Now the decorator crabs are really unique in the fact that they are small and fragile. And so what they'll do is they will take um, anemones and jellies and 
algaes and other organisms and glue them to the top of their shell. Um, and then when they molt, which means that they open up the back of their shell, climb out, you know, suck up a lot of water to stretch out that new shell before it gets hard, they will actually take their decorations with them and put them on top of their new shell as well. Um, so, I mean, you want to, you've gone to all that trouble of locating all of your, your special items. You don't want to just move every time and leave them behind. Uh, so these are the decorator crabs. And then we also will see in the tide pools um, these little graceful crabs. They're real, they're more flattened, more fan shaped. Um, and you can see it's got the little bars in there. This is a, obviously not my photo, but this is one that, to show you uh, because we don't see them all that often, but every once in a while you'll see these beautiful little more flattened um, crabs in the tide pools. And then, of course, we have our shore crab, which have more of a square body here, and then the dungeon nest. And this is the dungeon nest. Um, the reason I put this in here is because this is uh, an example of the, uh, the crab molting. So you can see where the, sh the back of the shell has been opened up, okay, to allow the crab to climb out. So a lot of times, whoops. Let me go back to this. A lot of times on the beach, what you'll see uh, looks like a bunch of dead crabs, but they're just simply molted because the, they've climbed out so the top carapace or the top shell just flops back down and sometimes it'll fill up with sand. Um, they will take their eyeballs with them, but they leave their old gill covers mm -hmm. because they've grown new gill covers. Okay, so that's that. Okay, now sea stars. Oh, you, we did see some little baby sea stars. Primarily what we're gonna see in the tide pools are gonna be the ochre stars. Um, in amongst, again, the shallow tide pools here. Um, this, this is that eel grass I was telling you about that's you know a wider blade than the surf grass. So ochre stars come in um, three kind of different shades and that is the purple, the ochre, and then the orange. So it's the ochres being like the uh, combination between them. Uh, there have been different ideas as to why they may have those colors, but um, pretty much they just come in different colors like we do. Now sea stars are in another in the group of animals called echinoderms or spiny skin. They have tube feet, um, they have radial symmetry, which means that they're round. Uh, they have a water vascular system. So instead of having blood, they actually use the salt water, okay? Just like we have 35 parts per thousand salt in our body, they just use the 35 parts per thousand salt water that they live in. Um, so in order to do that, this spot that you see here in the top of this sea star is called the madreporite. That's where they take that water in, like a filtered faucet, to you to run all their bodily functions, okay? And then in the very center, let me find my little arrow again, in the very center, this is actually where their anus is, up here. Their mouth is on the bottom. So down here underneath the sea star is their mouth because what they'll do, of course, is use their tube feet, thousands of them, to suck onto um, the muscle or barnacle that they're going to eat. eat. They um, use those tube feet to pull that apart just about only a millimeter is all they need to then push their stomach inside. And their stomach looks more like a gelatinous balloon and it comes in like five parts and it'll push it in and spread out as they start to release digestive fluid across the membrane of that um, stomach and they turn that uh, meat of the organism into liquid and then reabsorb it across the membrane of their stomach. Once they've finished eating, which could be anywhere from, you know, an hour to 24 hours, depending on the size of their prey, they pull their stomach back inside of their body. And um, so when you see a sea star that's humped over, like the two on the bottom, it's because it's actually in a feeding mode. And so again, there's that balance of where do you want to be? Do you want to be too high up in the tide pool so that all of a sudden you're in water for nine, 10 hours while you're eating? 
or do you want to be a little bit below? So there's got to be that balance. So there's that balance with the muscles as well. And these animals primarily, as, as adults, will feed on the muscles, but they'll feed on other organisms as well. Okay, so this gives you an example, uh, a real close-up of the tube feet here, moving this algae around here. So these are all the tube feet. Now, they not only use suction, but they actually, we've learned, put down a little uh, adhesive so they can glue themselves down. And then when they want to let go, each tube foot puts down a little solvent. So they can glue and unglue very quickly. But that's why if you go to try to take a, a sea star off the rocks, um, it's really on their tight because it's not only using suction, but it's also using glue. Um, and so what happens is that you may actually tear off their tube feet. Um, these animals can lose some of their appendages and regenerate new ones. Um, but you know, obviously, if you're going to lose a lot of them, then that's going to be detrimental to your health. Uh, we also have brittle stars. You probably won't see these too often unless you're actually out in one of the deeper typos because they really do like to be under the rocks. Uh, they're called brittle stars for a reason. The appendages break off very quickly and actually what they will do is if a predator grabs them, they will just drop off that, pre that appendage and it'll go wiggling so that it'll draw the uh, predator away as, as the rest of the animal moves off and then slowly regenerates that body part again. But these are brittle stars. And these are more primarily plankton feeding, whereas our other sea stars are primarily predators. Um, and the other thing about the other sea star, uh, about sea stars also is that they are um, uh, separate sexes. So that right now in the spring, as a matter of fact, you know, May and June, what you'll see is, um, if you're careful, you'll see uh, a sea star release an orange mass out into the water, and then all of a sudden other sea stars around it will release the white sperm. So the female releases her eggs, that triggers the males to release the sperm, and then, of course, um, all the there's external fertilization and all the little larvae are swimming off in the water um, before they go through metamorphosis and settle back down on the rocks again. Um, so that's one way that we can identify again if they're male and female. Okay, other sea stars that you'll see out there, the blood stars, uh, little red ones that you'll see down in the tide pools. Again, here's the six rayed star. Um, and then more subtitly, so only if you're down there, uh, normally when it's a minus tide and you're seen in the tide pool, will you find um, the bat stars and the rainbow stars. Um, I have seen the bat stars at Otter Rock um, and down in um, uh, Port Orford in the tide pools down there. Um, so, so you will see them, but they really like to be in those you know, channels also. Okay, so in other animals that are spiny skinned are the urchins. Uh, these are primarily grazers. We have red urchins, green urchins, and purple urchins. Uh, the photo that's down on the right here is actually taken from Yaquina Head. So you can see that these animals actually use their spines to make their burrows in their rocks um, by just wiggling back and forth. The spines are sharper. And in between there, the tube feet come up. Um, and to protect themselves, though, these, also, these animals also have little pedicel area. So another tube foot will come up with little pinchers on it. And that's how they'll pinch off the tube feet of sea stars trying to feed on them if the spines don't deter them. But you'll also notice that they actually will work really hard to camouflage themselves with rocks and other shells over the tops of them, a uh, little piece of wood. Um, Again, these are grazers, so they'll move out of the rock and primarily graze on the algae. Their mouth is on the bottom. So what you're seeing up at the top, Aristotle's lantern, and it has five teeth that it uses for scraping the algae off the rocks. The urchin down here at the bottom um, is uh, in the process of uh, dying, and so it's losing its spines. But what you can see with this, 
is that again that radial symmetry but each one of these little openings here is where tube feet or the spines are attached inside okay um, and then our other spiny skinned animal is actually a Q sea cucumber now um, sea cucumbers actually have soft spines and the interesting thing about this particular animal is that it's a detritus feeder so now we have uh, echinoderms that are predators um, grazers and this one is uh, uh, scavenger eats dead stuff so it moves through the rocks eating all the dead stuff um, and so this is the head of it this is the tail end of it and it also on the bottom part that you can't see are a bunch of little tube feet that it um, uses. Now we've talked a little bit about ways of protecting themselves and the fact that these echinoderms have pedicillary or pinchers. Well, sea cucumbers don't have the pinchers, but what they do have um, is a way of eviscerating um, their intestines. So what they'll do is if a predator starts to eat them, they'll just spit out their intestines and then as the um, predator is feeding on the intestines that they see over there, um, the sea cucumber moves away and regenerates its body parts. So, they're, so they've come up with all kinds of amazing ways of protecting themselves. This one uh, was actually, I photographed and in one of the tanks at the Hapford Marine Science Center. So that's what you're seeing down here in the bottom is the outflow um, for the tank there. And then this is a rock with a whole bunch of little strawberry anemones, but we'll, Look at those. Okay, so speaking of anemones, uh, anemones are in the jelly family, or uh, uh, off, or sorry, um, cnidarians, which means that they have stinging cells. So in their tentacles, they have um, stinging cells, those nematocysts, but anemones have more sticky cells. So they have statosis. Um, and the whole idea of that is that they want to stick to their prey and then take their prey into their gut and feed on it. So whatever falls on them, then they'll pull it together, they'll close up and bring it into their gut, feed on it, and then the waste comes out the same hole. Okay, now this particular anemone, the giant green one, is green because it also has an organism inside called zooxanthellae. And it looks like I'm running out of time here. <laughs> so I'm going to run zooxanthellae, which is an organism that keeps it green. It photosynthesizes for it when there's not a lot of food. And then we have the aggregating anemone, same thing. But the way this one um, reproduces, the other one kind of spawns. Uh, this one divides itself in order to grow. And that's why you see those little clusters. Okay, and they also defend their little territory. So this is a, uh, we talked about uh, reproduction defense. Up here um, on the upper left-hand corner, this is where an anemone is dividing itself so when you see these they're like a clonal family and there'll be bare rock in between them um, because if they get too close notice that they have these club like appendages that expand out and they'll sting each other so this is uh so they try to keep their bare rock in between there so that one clonal family doesn't impact the other clonal family and those are those little strawberry anemones. They're very tiny, but they actually have a little bit more toxin than obviously the big ones. And then the other thing we don't see too often, unless you're in those caves at a minus tide, are these little cup corals. So they're all in that Nidarian family. They all have um, those stinging cells, but we have two different um, organisms here. And then in the subtide, um, this is at a minus tide. You can see the sea stars are down at the bottom here. This is down here in seal rock. Here we have tunicates, um, sponges, and anemones, and barnacles. Um, so you'll see that there's a whole bunch of organisms. And again, a lot of competition for space um, when the tide's out. And then, of course, we'll see our little fish in the tide pools. We have um, different types of sculpin and the cling fish. If you pick up a rock and there's a rock uh, fish stuck to it, that's little, this little one here with a little sucker on it. Um, these are a type of sculpin that you'll see. And we have hundreds of tide pool sculpin of different colors and, um, and uh, shapes. 
the tunicates and sponges that are underneath the rocks here. Again, little tiny organisms that you'll see. This is a solitary tunicate, but then you'll see the colonial tunicate. And uh, that's all discussion for another time with all these organisms. The, another very subtitle organism is our sunflower star. We may not see too many of those anymore since they were really impacted by the sea star wasting. And there's that tunicate up close. This is the solitary tunicate. Now the tunicate is actually the organism that's closest to us phylogenetically. Um, it's a hemichordate. We are chordates. We have a you know, dorsal nerve cord. Well, in their larval stage, these organisms have a dorsal nerve cord, a nodomorphosis to either become, and so they're kind of like fish looking. They either go through metamorphosis to look like this, or to look like this slime. So we're kind of, you know, uh, closely related to slime. Sorry about the dogs barking in the background. I have no idea what they're barking at. Um, uh, other uh, subtitle organisms, abalone, you may see them in a subtype zone. The octopus, um, and it, this is a little red octopus, doesn't get very big. I've seen, seen these. Oh, we even had them at the bio blitz down in Port Orford. One crawled across our foot. It was so awesome. And then we have the Pacific giant. And then things that go bump in the sand, little mole crabs that you'll see in the tide pool areas, wherever it's sandy. Notice that this female has her eggs underneath her abdomen. Um, a lot of times the shorebirds, that's what they, all they want. They, dig these up, flip them over, and all they want to eat are the eggs out of the females. And again, not a true crab, so you can't tell the difference between the males and females unless you see the eggs on the female. Uh, other things that you'll find on the beach that I should mention that are subtitled, this was one that was just sent to me uh, the other day by um, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jess Haxel, who's also a marine biology instructor. Um, she uh, this is the, the shell that you'll find, but this is the organism that's swimming out in the ocean. So this is the part that we find on the beach the, of the sea butterfly here. It's just its little um, part of the, hard, the hardest part of its little body. It's a mollusk. Uh, Valella Valella jellies that you'll see, actually they're uh, hydroid. So each one of these is a colony of hundreds and hundreds of animals. They start out little tiny and uh, grow into be larger animals, but we see those come in by the wind sailors. Uh, they won't sting you they, um, because they're a plankton feeding um, hydroid. Um, uh, and, but, and then the only thing that's left is the shell of it or the supporting structure, which is more of the keratin. But a whole bunch of organisms go to form this one organism. Uh, tinafores are other things that you're going to see on the beach, these little comb jellies, and you'll see them in the water and they bioluminesce. So if you're out there at night and in the tide pool, you see like little bioluminescent um, organisms in the water, it could be these comb jellies that we see. And they're a uh, plankton feeding jelly. And then of course, the other thing that you'll see on the beach would be um, other jellies. Now this is a uh, um, sea nettle. So it's the, again, it's the tentacles you don't wanna touch because that's where the stinging cells are. But the um, mantle of this has no stinging cells, so it won't hurt you. And then salps, we saw these on the beach as well. And a lot of these, you can go online and um, YouTube, and see them out in the water. These organisms form a huge chain, but these are things that we found on the beach. I found, we found this on the beach down in Port Orford when we were down there one day. And then of course the tunicates um, that we're, we're finding on the beach. Um, we had uh, an inundation of them, you know, in 2015 when we had that warm blob. Um, they've been slowly, um, you know, uh, I, I, we've seen less and less of them over the last couple years, which is nice because the problem with them is that they, um, well, they can get to be quite large. You can YouTube these also, um, but they have silica in their um, tissue. And so it's um, fish can't eat them and actually get nutritional value from them, but it fills up their guts. Um, so 
they're not normally up here, but because of that warm blob that was up here, that's when we started seeing them. And that was, thank you for your time. <laughs> Fawn, that was so great. Sharing. Hi. <laughs> that was wonderful. Hi. So much great information. And it's, it's just so great to have this technology so that we can connect. Fawn is coming to us today from Seal Rock, Oregon. And um, yes. yeah, so if anybody has any questions, I see that um, a lot of you stuck around. We have a great crowd today. Um, Fawn, so thank you so much. We did have um, a couple of comments during uh, your presentation. One, uh, I don't know who it was from because it was just a number and not a name, but wondered if the limpet you were showing, the really large photograph of the limpet you were showing, if there was damage on that limpet. Um, another person, uh, Angela Reynolds, said thank you very much. And she had to, oh, go ahead. Okay, so the, yeah, so the, that's not damage on that limpet. That's the keyhole in the uh, top of it. And that's, um, the, there are two, the two different kinds of um, genus of limpets. And so that's actually a good thing because in that one, the anus comes out that hole instead of outside the head like it does on the other one. Okay, great. So yeah, um, no, no, just, we, just, we have some questions. <laughs> We have some questions coming in. Um, one, first one from John, are there any Coast Watch trainings tentative, tentatively scheduled? John, um, I'm gonna do another one online, but at this time, not quite yet. We are just barely starting to look into the future and maybe doing some uh, physically distanced uh, beach walks, but please, um, uh, stay tuned for that. So hopefully very soon we will be having uh, Coast Watch training on the beach with Fawn, which would be great. Um, just a lot of thank yous coming in, Fawn. Wonderful, knowledgeable presentation. Um, a great refresher. Learned a great deal. Um, okay, and then here we go. Oh, it's Marty Giles. Here we go. On, on the um, keyhole limpet, I was referring to the new edge without barnacles and the dent between the older part and the fresher part. Could you hear that, Fawn? Are you with Ooh, me? I don't know. Yes, um, I don't think so. I think what was um, going on was part of the foot was sticking out and because it seemed really, it was a really healthy one. Um, I, and I, uh, so I have to go back and look at that, but um, I don't, let's see, I can't move this at the same time, I don't think, um, and show. Let me go back and look real quick here at that, that particular keyhole limpet. Okay, and great. And while while you are looking, while you're looking for that, Fawn, um, just a couple. Another question: What are the laws to looking under mussels? Nancy, do you are are you asking just to take a peek underneath a mussel if you want to pick it up? Is that what you're talking about? Because if you are, um, I think it's okay to uh, to touch anything in a tide pool as long as you're being very very careful. Um, laws surrounding mussels in marine reserves um, are simply if you would like to uh, use one as bait, apparently you can, but there are different laws uh, for different jurisdictions in the tide pools um, depending on where you are. But as for just picking up a mussel and looking at it underneath of it, um, if that's what you mean, but feel free to type another question. Also, Kristen, uh, says that was amazing. Okay. Can't wait to go to a tide pool. Um, will we be able to access this webinar later? Yes, Kristen, you will. Um, like I said at the very beginning, all of these webinars will be available on our YouTube channel, and I will be sharing that address very soon. Um, I'm get, I'm editing a number of them so that they're more watchable. Um, so keep a lookout uh, for that uh, YouTube channel, and as soon as they're all ready, I'll be notifying everybody about that. Um, okay, and Nancy. For Marty, um, actually, okay. I've been on that um, that uh, particular slide, and uh, yeah, it's not damage. It, the what you what 
we're seeing in the upper, let me share this real quick here. I don't know if I can see. Um, share. Okay. Um, so what you see here uh, is the, the shell, and this is the foot sticking out and going underneath a clump of muscles and barnacles right here. And then down on the bottom is just a barnacle that's growing on the back of the shell. So there's no damage. This is a totally healthy um, animal here. Okay. She says um, she's thinking it may have been worn along uh, under the outside edge, perhaps rolling around after being knocked off, then new growth after that. The dent with the line of old broken off barnacles is what caught my eye. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Marty. Oh, uh, oh, oh, she's, yes. Yeah. Oh, I think she's talking about, yeah. That makes a lot of sense as well. I agree with her. Yeah. Um, well, wonderful. Oh, um, Nancy Thomas asks, what precautions should be taken not to harm the sea life? Do you want to answer that? Well, wherever you're, whenever you're down the tide pools, you want to make a point to try to walk on bare rock. Or if you're going to be walking up on the top where all the muscles are, you know, you just want to make sure that you're stepping softly so that you're not scuffing your feet or, you know, uh, are causing a lot of harm to them. I mean, they can withstand pressure. You know, you've seen the person who can lay on the bed of the nails is if you disperse that weight, then, you know, that then um, they can withstand that. Um, but, you know, we also try to, um, because we have thousands of people who come to our tide pools every year, um, the more that you can actually observe by walking around or walking on bare rock, um, that's the best way. Um, when I, when I do go down and I do take off a clump of muscles just for, you know, teaching purposes, I do put all those organisms back up and I do put the muscles back on because the muscles can reattach. They have bissel threads. That's how they're stuck on there to begin with. So they have one little foot that they put to put the bissel thread out and they can reattach. So all these animals can be reattached. So it's just a matter of being careful as to, you know, um, when you're taking them off. And, and if you're harvesting mussels, you know, you have to have a permit anyway. <laughs> I was just going to say that's exactly right. Even teaching organizations like Haystack Rock Awareness Program, any animals that you see that they have um, on their educational tables, all of uh, those animals um, have been collected with uh with permission from a from a permit usually from oregon department of fish and wildlife it looks like we have maybe have one more question let's see just thank you just another thank you and thank you fawn this was wonderful and i really look forward um to seeing yes fawn is uh i think i will share that as well so um fawn is reminding me and she That's is right. Yeah, her wonderful um, Coast Watch actually has some gear um, that is, it's a wonderful timing um, as folks get out onto the beach and actually as less staff from uh, Oregon Parks and Rec Department are going to be out there, Coast Watchers and other volunteers around the coast will be educating people as well. And we have for sale um, these wonderful uh, vests, Coast Watch uh, fleece vests. And we also have these great um, uh, hoodies that have on the back a great, there we go. So if any of you are interested in these, um, in this Coast Watch gear, uh, Fawn has some that she can send to you and so do I. Um, they're between 26 and $31, I, I think, and that includes shipping. Um, so just let us know. And thanks for that reminder, Fawn. Um, and yeah, so I just wanted to say thank you to everybody again. And uh, this will be available on our YouTube channel if you ever want to come back for a refresher. And yeah, Fawn and I will um, hopefully see you on the beach this summer. We'll see how things go. But I would love to have Fawn back. Um, 
in about a month or so. And an idea is to maybe provide Fawn with a whole slew of photographs that our Coast Watchers send. And then she can kind of go through and talk about those. And we can maybe talk about what we've seen on the beach in the next month. How does that sound, Fawn? Can you hear me okay? Sounds like a blast. Awesome. <laughs> I've got some awesome slides that we can add to those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can, uh, yeah, because I can add some of those that, you know, Coast Watchers have sent me, because um, it's one from one of the presentations called Coast Watch Findings. Okay, awesome. Find amazing stuff. On the beach. And if you guys right. haven't read Strand, um, I just finished reading The Strand by um, uh, Henderson, and it was really interesting because that was all about her Coast Watch Mile, which is normally... Uh, it's down near Tehachinich, which is nothing but dunes and sand, but um, you find amazing things, even, you know, in the middle of nowhere on the beach. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so, I love to see your findings. Yes, and uh, The Strand by Bonnie Henderson. Um, that is a wonderful book. And yes, it is all about um, Bonnie and her mile, and she wrote an incredible book about it. And I'm excited because Bonnie said that she would come and speak to Coast Watch um in 2021 or at the end of this year because she has a new book coming out um about hiking along the oregon coast so super excited to um have bonnie on later in the year but yeah in the meantime check out the strand at your local bookstore um and uh yeah give it a read it's a really good one and we're gonna say goodbye uh, again, my name is Jesse. I thank you all for joining us. You can contact me at jesse at oregonshores.org. And you can also contact Fawn at fawn at oregonshores.org and um, ask Fawn any questions. Again, I, she is our citizen science trainer. She is still with us. Um, so have a great day out there, everybody. And thanks again for coming. And I'll, find, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for okay, coming. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Thanks guys. Thanks for coming. It was a great presentation. Bye. Mm -hmm.